Good evening, everyone. I'm broadcasting live. Welcome to our live broadcast. Today's quote is about three types of people, three individuals. Tayomi, Pugala, Loke, Upajamana, Upajanti, Bahuchana Hitaya, Bahuchana Sukaya, Lokanu Kampaya, Ataya, Hitaya, Sukaya, Deva Manusana. These three beings, are, when they arrive, when they're born, are born for the benefit of many, for the happiness of many, for the um, compassion, sort of compassion for the world, for the benefit and well-being and happiness. So, divine and human beings it's a good thing no there's three types of people who you can think of as being of great benefit to the world it's great when they when they are are born who do, who do we think of as being great people. No? I think of great people as those who change the world, those who bring justice to the world. We often think of evil people as being great in the sense of great evil. But when we think of those who are of great benefit to the world, we have, well, it depends who you ask, of course, but we go through history or some of the, I guess, religious leaders would often be held in that regard. Buddha, Jesus, or Muhammad, Lao Tzu, Bodhidharma, Shinren. And then you have modern figures, political figures, uh, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. You have, uh, all over the world, you have, you have mystics like um, there's this guy in, uh, in Bulgaria I was told about. What's his name? You have people like Einstein. You have uh, these great people who are of great benefit to the world, supposedly. But benefit is a tricky thing, right? What is a real benefit if someone builds lots of hospitals? Is that, a, is that a benefit to the world? If someone overthrows a political regime, is that a benefit to the world? It is really a benefit. You know, there's many things that uh, are ostensibly quite obviously beneficial, but but on a deeper level, what is a real benefit? Because there are many things that seem to be a benefit, but in the end don't solve. It's not that they don't solve problems, it's that they don't, well, they don't actually solve problems. Like take, take healthcare, for example. If you cure sickness or build hospitals, or, this is a good thing. I think from a Buddhist point of view, this is a good thing. But bringing about health 
on a physical level isn't a goal in and of itself because you're still going to get sick and die and you're going to be born again and get sick again and die again and bringing about political change isn't an end in and of itself and it's funny how we often think that is an end in and of itself if 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 we're able to topple a corrupt government and we feel like we've we're victorious you know, democracy is won for how long right we can see democracy the democracies of today being corrupted having really been corrupted since the beginning of We talk about saving the planet. Uh, you know, we talk about any any mundane benefit turns out to be um, circumscribed by impermanence, and and that's important in this sense to to get a sense of why there's only three types of people who are the Buddha considered to be um, a great benefit and why these three are the highest it's because these three have found something that is permanent that is lasting that is truly meaningful in that sense if you have a goal or a, a something that a benefit that is temporary well in the face of eternity it doesn't actually mean much at all it doesn't mean anything you know, something that makes you it brings you peace for a short time and then is gone it, it ends up quite meaningless because eternity is a long time this is a this is I think crucial in in terms of the difference between a view of nihilism or um, there being nothing after death and the view of uh, there being of eternalism there, there, there being existence for eternity it's, uh, if there's nothing after death then well everything is meaningless it's nothing that has real meaning meaning is incredibly limited if uh, if if after death there's nothing if our the whole sum of our existence in this universe is one life i mean it it kind of makes it, it obviously makes some good sense with the empirical evidence that we have from a physical point of view it doesn't make any sense from a mental point of view. It doesn't make any sense from the point of view of this consciousness being distinct from all other consciousness. Um, the idea that at death there could be nothing. It's a very, uh, it's a pernicious sort of belief. It doesn't, hold, it doesn't in the end hold up to scrutiny. And I know this is a controversial topic, and some of the people who are very ve quite vehement that belief in rebirth is not warranted, it's not necessary. Anyway, I digress. I'm going to assume, well, I'm going to make it clear that that I'm coming from a point of view that reality is reality is continuous. Reality is based on experience, and experience doesn't end just because the body breaks up. The body isn't real anyway, it's not a part of experience. And it affects the, the, the body, bodily breakup affects experience. It can disrupt it, but it can't destroy it. Not when there's still craving is the point, because craving is, is productive is what creates, perpetuates existence. Anyway, so the point being that these three types of people are those who have found a way out, who have found freedom, 
who have come to experience true bliss and, and release and, and true peace. The first is, of course, the Buddha. And this uh, this quote is actually just the verse from this sutta. The, 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 it's a sutta the Buddha talks about. The, quote, the Pali that I quoted earlier is, is the actual sutta. It says there are three types of people. The first is a Buddha who arises. He, he describes a Buddha in all his qualities. And he teaches the Dhamma that is good in its beginning, beautiful in its beginning, beautiful in its middle, and beautiful in its end. With uh, Satang Sambayanjanam. It's funny, this is something they ch we actually chant this in Thailand. Ida Tatha Agato Loke Upad. No, it's not Upachati, it's Upadjo. Upadjo Arahang Sama Samputo Vija Charana something else. Different, different uh, tents of. But basically the same thing. So when a Buddha arises, this is of course a great benefit. It's a real benefit because uh, there's a, a a benefit to the Buddha's teaching that is uh, is eternal. It changes the course of one's journey, and it provides a a true end to the journey. Allows us to find the find the goal, to come to a destination. The other two are followers of the Buddha. So an arahant, follower of the Buddha, who is arahang hoti kina who is one who has cut off the taints, who, like the Buddha, has freed themselves from suffering. The Buddha is like the first, he said he's like the first to a bunch of eggs. The Buddha is like the first that hatch. All the rest hatch after, but they're the same. It's the same freedom. And so these these beings are also not not understood to be as knowledgeable about the path as the Buddha. I mean, they've They've relied upon the wisdom of others to to propel them to freedom. So their enlightenment is considered to be inferior in the sense that they're not really clear, they're not entirely clear about what they've done. I mean, maybe that is not fair. Well, they're lesser than, they don't have all the knowledge of a Buddha. Certainly very profound and very much able to teach the path that they have followed to others. The third is a seka, seko hoti patipado bahusudo sila vatupano. So you have a sawaka, a follower who is a seka. Seka means someone who is sika. Sika means training. Seka is someone who is in training. This is someone who has seen nirvana, seen nirvana for themselves, but is still working on purifying their mind. So they're practicing and they are bahusutto. They have heard much and have see the what? See the what to. They are someone who is Upapano, uh, who's attained to, uh, who's moral, who's ethical. Um, and what this means is they've attained to ethics, means through the realization of Nibbana for the first time, there's a, there is a certain minimum ethic that an enlightened being of this sort will keep, even though they still have greed, they still have anger, they still have delusion. They have come to a, what the Buddha called Arya Kanta Sila, which is a morality that is uh, beloved of the noble ones. The noble ones keep this morality. They don't kill, they don't steal, they don't cheat, they don't lie. They might still um, 
be unpleasant and do things wrong, just not not uh, wrong to an extreme. So these three, uh, whether we become one or whether we whether we're talking about who we associate with, three beings that are worth thinking about. They're the highest among gods and humans. They are bringers of light, speakers of Dhamma. They open the doors of the immortal, the deathless wing, and set many beings free from bondage. So you don't have to be an arahant to lead others. Even someone who is a sotapanna has a great wisdom that they can share. Even just a sotapanna. Someone who has seen Nibbana for themselves. They've been there. They know the destination, they can describe the path that leads to that destination. So that's the Dhamma for today. I have no meditators here. Michelle left this morning, and then this afternoon our new meditator came to, to report, and just now I went downstairs to, to go to the washroom and saw his door was open. Sure enough, there was a note on his desk saying he had gone. Which happens? You know, it's really the only... If you're concerned, if you come to meditate here and, and you're concerned about what it'll be like, what the results will be, um, whether you succeed. Many meditators are worried about whether they'll succeed, whether they'll actually be capable of, of uh, practicing and that, that's it really the, the the only way you can fail this course is by leaving I mean it's not not to say even it's a failure but you, you can't succeed if you leave and again I'm not really criticizing this person I mean, it's difficult he was young he was under 20 20 tends to be a bit of a cutoff but uh, it's a tough course and there are often people who leave early come back but it's not easy and this is what this does happen people don't you don't go crazy practicing this type of meditation it's not something that um, you can actually get on the wrong path and what happens is people are just leave it's difficult you're you're alone in a room for much of you much of the day so there's no shame in leaving you can't take it come back and try again anyway he said it helped him staying here a couple of days so to start but uh, so that means we have space right now if anyone wants to come and meditate we have space just opened up beyond that we're full for August half of September and we've already got people signed up for October and November and even December and Robin's here, good evening Robin Soti Bhante okay. so are you coming tomorrow? no, when are you coming? tomorrow Okay. And how long are you staying? Um, I was worried that there wouldn't be room for me to stay for a couple of days to meditate after I helped move. But if there's room, I'd like to. I actually don't have to be back at work until the twenty fourth. Well, there's room. So. I mean, I think I think we have a lot of room in July, don't we? Or do we have people coming? We don't Not sure. The month we do, but. Yeah, I can just leave it flexible. If there are people there and you need the space, I can leave early. If there's room, I'd, I'd like to stay and meditate for a couple of days after the move, if possible, if there's room. Right, so there's someone coming this Saturday, and then another person on Monday, and then another person on... Oh, but by that time, we'll be moved, right? So when we moved, we have four rooms. We've got room uh, right up until 22nd... Uh, August. Am I reading that right? No. 
1st of August. 1st of August, we're, we're full. With four meditators. But, sorry, we're not even full then, you know, we have, we do have a spare room. We could fit a fifth meditator, what do you think? In the new place? In the new place. Well, we've got six rooms, right? I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen what those rooms look like. What? They're all big. Six big rooms. Oh, okay. That's about it. If you think of a, of a building with six big, big rooms, some hallways, and a big living room, that's it. And there's no dining room or... There's a kitchen as well. A kitchen and a big living slash dining room. Good. Pretty Is there a... Close. Is there a washer and dryer? Yes. Good. Kind of very important. <laughs> tucked into one corner and two bathrooms, which is you know, two That's full good. bathrooms, which is better than this place. And someone asked how far it is from Hamilton. It's actually not far from here. It's in Hamilton. We're here. The university is here. It's here, it's about just a little further away from the university on the other side. So is it walking distance from the old place? No. Well, what depends what you mean by walking. It would take you a couple hours, I'd assume an hour maybe? Actually, I don't know. It takes oh, okay. half an hour to get from here to the university, I think. I've done it. I think it's about a half an hour. Okay. So it's probably closer to an hour from here. Probably more, I'm, I'm not sure. But it's kind of the other direction. The university is that way, and the place is that way. Most important question, is there a Tim Hortons nearby for your breakfast, Bonte? Well, this is the thing. No, there's not. Oh. No Tim Hortons, no Subway, no Pita Pit. Oh. There's a diner. So maybe you and I could go to the diner and work something out. To set up an account for you, maybe. Mm. Maybe that's we have to do it. Start going through the... I mean, there's also the question of whether we want to set up an account with the university again. Sure. I mean, that's terribly convenient, if not cheap. Uh, well, food in Canada doesn't tend to be cheap, and no matter where you get it, it seems like. It's what? Food in Canada is pretty expensive no matter where you get it, so, you know. You say expensive? Yeah. Well, you have to remember our, our dollar isn't as much, doesn't, Cost as much as yours, although I suppose you don't understand that. Sure. Really high. Yeah, you know, even with that, food in, in Canada is pretty costly. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think no matter where you go, just I'm sure your supporters want you to get the best possible nutrition, the, mm -hmm. you know, the healthiest fare that's available. So, is the food at the university fairly healthy? Or you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Is the food at the university fairly healthy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's one thing you can say about university food. It may cost an arm and a leg, but actually it's not that. It's not really much more expensive than than food outside of the university. Honestly, it's they say how expensive it is. I don't think it's that expensive comparatively. Uh, but, yeah, it's very healthy. You can get really good quality food, good vegetarian food, especially if you're, if you're a vegetarian. It sounds like a good option to set up an account for you. But I imagine the diner is much cheaper. Okay. And on days that I don't go to the university, it's a lot closer. So maybe we can go talk to them. Who knows? Maybe they're Buddhist, uh, Buddhist sympath sympathizers. All right. So do we do we got some questions? We do. Bante, what exactly is the designation of our tradition? I know Mahasi Saija. You mentioned Glenka the other day. But what is the official answer when someone asks about it? And it was a great explanation on the type of meditation yesterday, so thanks for that. Maybe lineage is what he's asking about. 
can mention later on lineage. Someone said I look tired yesterday. I think I am. It's kind of, it's this weird sort of transition. I still haven't completely transitioned to Canadian time, so somehow my body is deciding to shut down around 8, 8 p.m. or something. It's really because in a few hours I'll be, I'll be wide awake. <laughs> this is uh, a little bit of a dazed. My body's not sure what I'm trying to do to it. I'm moving from Thailand to Sri Lanka, back to Canada. And uh, I don't spend a lot of time outdoors, so my body has, I guess my body's trying to figure out what time is sun time. Um, we have these kind of inner clocks. Anyway, I'm glad that still, still able to bring benefit. Our tradition is, ah, you know, I mean, words. You can you can categorize things any which way you want. Someone asked me this today. A guy came, knocked on the door, and said he wanted to learn about meditation. So I gave him a book, talked to him, and he asked kind of the same thing. And he started talking about Mahayana Buddhism. So we're Theravada Buddhism. What that means is we follow the teachings and the uh, opinions of a group of elders, starting with the Buddha, but um, based, I guess, based on a specific set of texts, um, which we claim, as all traditions do, claim to be both the orthodox teachings of the Buddha and the orthodox explanations of the teachings of the Buddha. That's called the Theravada. Thera means elder. Thera means elder. Ovada or Wada mean Wada. I guess means uh, the teaching or the view or the way of explaining. And within the Theravada, of course, there are still many different ways of understanding those explanations and those interpretations. And there are even people who come from a Theravada tradition but have discarded a lot of the traditional explanations of the Buddhist teaching in favor of their own explanations. Our, tra our tradition is very, fairly traditional. We do follow the orthodox interpretations, mostly. But uh, that's because we follow the Mahasi Sayada, who was very much steeped in the traditional culture of the Theravada and uh, very knowledgeable about it as well. But even he argued sometimes with the commentaries and uh, gave his own interpretation or, or you know, it was open to to some giving some leeway in that sense but still Theravada most definitely Theravada and um, gave a specific meditation technique that he sort of gleaned from well from his teacher but also from the Visuddhimagga and texts like that so we often call ourselves the Mahasi Sayadaw tradition because that, that's our root teacher who sort of started or popularized anyway this meditation technique. It became very popular once he started because at that time Burma was in its Buddhist heyday. It was, a, it was really a, um, a stronghold of Buddhist practice and study. This was before the military coup and, and junta that followed, which is it's interesting that all that came after such great Buddhist practice. It's almost like Mara coming in, you know. Mara can't take all that goodness. It comes in and destroys it. Hmm. Think of how many places that's happened too. You're breaking up still, Robin. I, I'm assuming that's at your end, that your internet's got a problem. Could be. Sorry about that, Monday. Or maybe it's my audio, but I think my audio is fine this time. It doesn't sound like my audio pro problem. Let me see here. No, my audio is fine. Um, what would it be? Could be Google. We were okay in the beginning. Now, How's that? 
Nasaan na ba? No. No. Yeah. It doesn't even sound like it's an internet problem. It sounds more like it's a CPU problem, like your computer is stuttering or my computer is stuttering. I think so. Did that help at all? I just changed oh, something yeah. in this. That's is that good. better? Yeah. Oh, okay, I changed something in the settings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bhante, how can one focus on studying the path, practicing and teaching with no money? How can one survive without a job? My plan is to build a farm to plant what I eat with one close friend, but we have to have money to do that. I see some people like you and don't know how they survive or if they work. I mean, working demands a lot of effort and time, basically most of your day. So how does one live without wanting, without wasting your time in a company or without having to live in a monastery? I live with my family and don't work. I spend my time studying at home and practicing and I suffer a lot from pressure from my family to move. Move, move from your family and to leave your family? Sounds like it, yes. I mean, that's why, you know, it's funny that you say to not live in a monastery because that's the whole purpose of monasteries. That's the very purpose of them. So you want to go and, you want to go and build your own institution where you build a, you know, a farm and plant what you eat. Um, well, good luck. I mean, that's not the model that the Buddha chose. And, and you're right, it's not quite reasonable to think that you can do that. You need money. And even if you do that, you're still going to have to grow your own food and, you know, farming is not a joke. So if you want to know how can you focus on studying the path, practicing and teaching with no money? all in the robes. I mean, it's not just the robes, it's in the monastery. It's in the family center. I mean, obviously, actually, I'm not a model because I'm sort of starting out on my own, so to speak. I don't have, I don't have that kind of cushion. My cushion is all of you. I work, you could say, but I work teaching. People think that worthy, and so they feed me. But in a monastery, you know, the, the people will feed the monks just because, as we saw with the quote, you know, these beings are great. It's great to have these beings around. Um, because they teach, but uh, also because they provide an institution where we might come and do the same, or they provide, just because they're, they're praiseworthy. You know, these are the kind of people you want to support. If all they do is help themselves, well, good for them. They're doing something that is a great help to themselves. That's worth appreciating and worth supporting. So monasteries are a great way for that kind of sort of thing to happen. Yeah, the kind of homesteading movement that's so popular now. So many people talk about that and write about that on forums and things, but that's mm -hmm. a lot of hard work. A lot of work, especially people that live off grid and don't have electricity or anything. It's a lot of work. Also, it's common to cry and feel a great joy when being present and contemplating. Is it common to cry and feel a great joy when being present and contemplating things? I always cry and didn't feel nothing, just cry. Some people will call it experiencing God in all things. We'd call it crying, but it's uh, based on rapture, what we call piti, or rapture in the sense of this rapturous feeling, cry for cry out of joy. So those are feelings you'd have to say to yourself, crying or happy, happy. It happened to me when I first did, did my first course in Thailand. 
But it was also sadness and grief and just release of stress. This crying is a great stress relief, but it felt great. I was crying for like an hour. What is the difference between the green question symbol and the yellow? Green is if you if you're one of the meditators. Look look at the logged in users, you'll see the same color scheme. Green means those people who have meditated recently. Who are on the list basically. You see the list below? It gives the last three hours or so. If you're on that list, you're green. It's useful for us to sort of get a sense of who's meditating and who's not. That's the idea. And I know that some people are medit obviously meditating at other times, but the idea here is for us to be in a meditative state when we come here. So we do want, we do wish for people to join, people joining here who have meditated with us in the past hour or so. I think there was another question earlier up that I skipped that um, someone had asked why they were at zero when they had done some meditation before. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe it wasn't clear that it starts out at whatever number you enter and then it winds down to zero. So that means that you are done, actually, if you're at zero. Well, the list is, it's, it's all about this list. You see this meditator list. Everyone on here should be in green. If you're not in green and you're on that list, then we have a problem. Every, everyone's still clicking on the animal, and I kind of stop. Yeah. Clicking on everything. It's a funny little game. Let's say you're doing some type of breathing meditation. How would the technique be if you're trying to get vipassana or samatha? Same with walking, lying, and standing. But it's not so much the technique, it's the object. You know, when you talk about the breath, breath is a concept. If you're going in, out, in, out, it's very easy to get to samatha because there's nothing going in, there's nothing going out, and in is just a concept, out is just a concept. But if you're focusing on the feelings, at the nose or at the stomach or in the chest, these feelings are real. So if you say to yourself, rising, the feeling of the rising, the tension, that's, that's real, and so that's vipassana. But the breath going in and out is is much more samatha. You could argue that there's vipassana in there, but it's not really because in is not real. You're not experiencing that. And same with walking. But if you're walking, you're focusing. If you say to yourself, feet, maybe that's a bad one. If you when your foot moves, you say foot, foot, foot would probably be a bad. It will be a samatha. Because the foot is is not changing, it's not real. It's a part of the experience. Isn't the real conflict in the human mind the belief in truth or lies? Belief in truth or lies? Well, belief is a huge part of the problem, but simple ignorance is really at the root. It's, belief, it's ignorance that leads us to believe lies. Ignorance is the real problem. And it doesn't take belief to give rise to conflict. Although maybe, yeah, maybe it does. Not, not, not necessarily, no, because uh, a person can get angry without belief. I mean, it depends exactly what you mean by belief. But yeah, even, even with what we would traditionally call belief, without it, you can get angry, you can get greedy. But um, ignorance... Ignorance is necessary. If you don't have ignorance, if you're not ignorant, meaning in the sense if you if you know something to believe to be harmful, you won't give rise to it. So once you understand that greed and anger are harmful, there won't even be the tendency to give rise to them. 
So ignorance is really at the root. And that's why our practice is all about seeing clearly. When you see clearly, you give up ignorance and you give up wrong view, you give up belief in, in lies. But even still, you could believe a lie. An enlightened being could believe a lie. If it was clever enough, if someone came, well, if someone came to an enlightened being and said, well, your house is on fire, well, it's possible that they might believe them if they thought they were trustworthy, even if it were a lie. Hello, sir. I just recently heard the term Buddhaverse. What are your thoughts on this term? I don't have many thoughts on that term. I guess it's a sense that I mean, it's more a Mahayana concept, I think, although it may be mentioned in Theravada. There's a sphere of influence of a Buddha. Yeah, it is in the Theravada as well. That there's a sphere beyond which a Buddha doesn't exert influence. Although, there, you know, we study this in the Musidi Maga that I think in the end, I don't know. Again, I don't have much, many thoughts on this sort of thing. It's beyond my comprehension of these sorts of things. I don't remember that exact term from the Visuddhimagga. No, but the sphere of influence. When we were, when we were looking at uh, uh, remembering past lives, I think it talks about, um, I think it was that one, it talks about this, the, the realm of influence of a Buddha. I guess I'm mixing it with something else. I know Mahayana is big on that because they have Buddhas visiting other Buddhas and ridiculous stuff like that. Buddha lands. What is the significance of listening to the recitation of the Patimokkha each Upasata? To, to remember the rules, you know, to keep the rules in mind. The idea is that as you're reciting them, the monks uh, listening can recall whether they have broken any of those rules. And if, if when they're listening, they recall, oh yes, I've broken it. They're supposed to sit up and say, excuse me, Venerable Sirs, I just remember that I broke this rule. And then they're supposed to confess it and continue on with the recital. That's my understanding. It doesn't happen nowadays. Nowadays it's just recited and rather quickly in most cases. Nobody ever interrupts. Because what they do is they do a, a formal confession blanket confession for anything they might have done wrong just kind of kind of um not really in the spirit of things but it makes things a lot easier which may be a bad thing i suppose is it okay for lay people to chant as much as monks yeah. As little as monks. I don't do an awful lot of chanting. How far should one go to help a family member? No farther than is you know, reasonable as a duty, as an obligation, as a, sort of, um, as a meditation practice. If it goes beyond your own practice of mindfulness and practice of clarity and peace of mind it's probably going too far because the idea is that helping others especially family members is a great practice it makes you a better person so if it does that there you go but if it makes you a foul cranky miserable person you're probably going too far on the other hand, it can be a good test, but no. If it just makes you give rise to more and more defilements, then you're doing it wrong. And then there is a question that I believe went with uh, a question above. Does meditation help with this conflict, the conflict about the human mind believing in truth or lies? Yeah, I mean, I think I've already kind of touched on that. Meditation, of course, helps you see clearly, which gives up your wrong beliefs. I 
don't understand why milk, soya milk, rice milk, etc., are considered solid food. They're not considered solid food. They're considered liquid food. If you blend up a steak, it's still a steak. In fact, even meat broth is probably considered food. The point isn't w what's considered food. The point is, what are the exceptions to the rule that the Buddha allowed? And he only allowed very few exceptions to the rule. The only exceptions he allowed are, in the evening, you can have fruit juice. That's the only exception. Vegetable juice is also allowed. Or root juice, you got uh, fruit juice, flower juice, root juice, bark juice, I think. Uh, what did I miss? I don't know. Different kinds of juice. Um, and then you've got, if you're sick, you're allowed to have uh, oil or butter or, or sugar. And if you're, and, and, you're allowed to have keep those and have them for up to seven days. And also, if you're sick, you're allowed to have any type of medicine. Yeah, that's, you know, within reason. Of course, you couldn't claim that food was medicine. But um, things that cure diseases, and these are like salts and chemicals, you know, like pills, those kind of things. Those you can keep forever. But those are the only exceptions. So everything else is food. Everything else is considered not exact, not just food, but it's considered um, yava, yava kalika. There's there's different types of food. So yava kalika is most stuff. Yama kalika is fruit juice. You're allowed to have it overnight. Uh, sataha, I think the third one is called sataha kalika. Is it, it, you're able to keep for seven days, and those are things like butter and oil and sugar. And then yawajivika, I don't know, yawajivika, jivika, yawajivata, I don't know. You're allowed to have for your whole life. Those are like medicines, like pills and stuff. If someone's doing something that's not right, should you point that out with or without an, an expression of disapproval, or should you keep it to yourself? I mean, you can. As far as should, I mean, the only thing you should do is become free from suffering. If you keep that in mind, you're much less inclined to worry about the problems of others. Because in the long run, you have to ask yourself, is this helping me become free from suffering? That's your only responsibility. So I mean, often that has to that it's just natural to help people by letting them know what they're doing wrong. But quite often it's natural just to keep it to yourself. And you just have to be wary that it's not laziness or uh, indifference that's leading you to. I mean, indifference can be actually useful, but this kind of stupid indifference that doesn't really see the difference between good and evil. If you see something is wrong and it's clear that this person can benefit from hearing that it's wrong, then it's probably a good idea to let them know that it's wrong. But only if you think they'd be able to under be able to receive it. Now, the worst thing is to be a, you know, a preachy. This is uh, Buddhists can often be like this, Buddhist meditators anyway. It's, it's, it brings them great faith in what they do and so they try to correct other people's behavior and fix other people's problems. So it's much more about when people come to you with their problems. Like if someone is clearly expecting you to react to their behavior, then you should react appropriately and let them know, you know, that sort of behavior is not, not cool in my books. Tira Damo thanks you in his book. How do you know him? I don't. Someone thanks me. <laughs> this is getting weird. <laughs> People are quoting me on the internet and uh, in our little internet anyway. Thanking me in books. I mean, it's great. It's great to be uh, 
be helpful. Someone's quoting you in their book that, or no, thanking you in their book. That's a great thing. I don't even know who that is. Tira Dhammo. Sounds a bit familiar, but not really. I wonder if it's possible to put the name of the book. Mm -hmm. What do you think of monks who laugh a lot and make a bunch of bad jokes? Mm -hmm. well, well spoken. Um, well, there's a difference between making jokes and laughing a lot. Laughing a lot is probably a sign of frivolity. Making jokes. I, mean, I think to some extent a joke can be useful for disarming you know, disarming a situation, breaking the ice. I think the problem is there are, it has to be said, and, and I'm not actually thinking of the person mentioned here, but there is the case where um, a sermon is just full of jokes. A sermon or a preaching or teaching. But with jokes or without jokes, um, there's quite a difference between a teaching that in the end teaches you something and a teaching that doesn't. I've, I, in Thailand, um, I've listened to talks that were very entertaining. And I remember as a young monk kind of being like, wow, this guy's a great teacher. And then someone, I looked over and the guy next to me was dour and frowning and scowling even. And, and he said to me afterwards, he said, that was the most useless Dhamma talk in the world. What is this guy? You know, to, and I, I thought about it. I felt really embarrassed because I was like, he's right. I really didn't learn anything from that. And not anything of any great value. Um, so I think that's the, the, the worst, is when you give a talk that is devoid of any real value, but it was entertaining. Uh, I think there's also a lot of teachings that are superficial. So they're feel-good kind of teachings teachings that give you some sort of uh, common sense wisdom. So they tell a story of, you know, people tell monks who tell stories, and these stories sort of ring true with you. So it makes you feel good, it makes you think, yeah, you know, that's really wise. And uh, that, that, that I think is misleading as well. It's not wrong, but it's just not very profound. In the end, if it helps you live your life better, well, that's great, but it may, may not get you all that much closer to enlightenment. So there's these kind of teachings that aren't wrong, but uh, are still inferior. You know, in the Buddha's time, they wouldn't give a talk without including the Four Noble Truths. This became a, a sort of a, a litmus test for a proper Dhamma teaching. Did it incorporate in some form or other? You don't have to mention them, but did it incorporate suffering and the cause of suffering? Did it connect these two and help people to uh, to see that we're causing themselves suffering and be free from suffering? To address the problem is the way. It can be deceptive, you know. A really sort of informal teaching can actually include that. It talks about letting go. Are having bad or negative thoughts considered mental misconduct, or does the misconduct arise depending on how we react to those thoughts? Well, there's no such thing as a negative thought per se. The thought itself is neutral. But yes, how you react to it is, is uh, negative or positive. So for example, you think about someone you hate, someone you hate, you think about them. The thinking about them at the very beginning is just a thought. It's actually neutral. Even if the thought is about, say, killing that person. When the thought arises about killing, it's, I mean, it's a result of your, your perpetuating this, this narrative of wanting to harm the person. Because you want to harm the person, you give rise to this thought, hey, I should kill them. But it's just a thought. That thought, in the whole process of hatred, the thought itself is neutral. But when you say to yourself, yes, and when you grasp onto that as a good thing, that's the problem. Is 
So the reason you disregard Anapanasati because of your breath is a concept concept, does that mean you wouldn't recommend it yeah. even though the Buddha talked about it? Um, well, we practice Anapanasati, it's just we focus on the stomach. But yes, the Buddha practiced Anapanasati using Samatha first. He went through all the jhanas and gained all sorts of magical powers. That's called Jeta Vimuti. The path that we practice is Vipassana only. So it's not wrong, it's not, I don't discard it. But it's not Vipassana. For the most part, it's Anapanasati is the Samatha. Anapanasati, for the most part, makes people feel calm and enter into great states of absorption. For the most part, as I've said, it is possible to practice vipassana. Even Mahasi Sayada said so, and I'm in perfect agreement. Even if I wasn't just going to believe what he said, it's clear that that's true. But and my understanding, and from what I've descriptions of other people, it's much more difficult to gain vipassana watching the nose, say, because it's much more subtle. You watch the stomach, it's still anapanasati, it's still mindfulness of breathing, if you must call it that. But it's uh, much more coarse, much more obvious, much more unstable, much more challenging. sense of challenging your views and beliefs and opinions, forcing you to see impermanent suffering and non-self. It's harder to see that here. I'm not saying you can't, but it's much more subtle. I suppose that's just my opinion, but it comes from talking to meditators about it. Tira Dhammo is apparently a senior monk in the Ajahn Chah tradition from Vancouver. Yeah. Maybe he thanks me because I got him started or something and now he's gone to the Ajahn Chah tradition. Not very flattering to think that he's changed traditions, but it could also be otherwise. Maybe he's in the Ajahn Chah tradition but has found my videos useful or something, which is nice. What do you think of monks who smoke but are... Or, or he's thanking me for the digital poly reader, which is something else. It's nothing to do with this. Ah, okay. Yeah, they, yeah, that was sort of a useful thing. What do you think of monks who smoke but are saints mm -hmm. and enlightened? I think it's easy to say that someone's enlightened. I think regardless of whether they smoke or not, a lot of those monks weren't what they said, what they were thought to be. And I'm only saying that not because I knew them or because I have any first-hand knowledge, but because 90% 90, 90 of people who have been thought to be arahants are certainly not arahants. And that's just simply because people are far too quick to call someone an arahant. And because monks are often give airs that they are enlightened maybe exhibit magical powers that are interpreted as meaning they're enlightened. But all those arahants in that tradition, it's really funny that that group has so many arahants and they just sort of come from living in the forest for long enough. I don't know, that's cynical and it, and it sounds like I'm just maybe don't understand that living in the forest is such a great thing, but if you read their teachings, often these teachings are not the teachings of an enlightened one. There's, talk of, there's some weird stuff in that tradition, honestly. I mean, and it, that it depends on interpretation, but like, um, anyway, I don't want to really go into it, I suppose, but um, I, I honestly, I think smoking is smoking, not a good sign. But I think you have to understand that a lot of these monks were overestimated. And I've talked to these, I've lived in these monasteries with these people and they'll pull out this, this guy put, once pulled out this book and started talking about these monks. This one became an arahant in this place, this one became an arahant and all these arahant, 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 they're all arahants. Like how would you even know? How would you even know whether someone was an arahant? That they just have this blind faith that all these monks are arahants. 
because their tradition somehow has the monopoly on arahants. But I mean, of course, everyone thinks their teachers are enlightened. It's, far, it's overestimation, there's no question in my mind. Some of them might be a sotapanna, some of them might even be arahant, but not most of them. It's not, it's not, it's not true. There's no question in my mind that that's overestimation. Especially with those monks who smoke. Yeah, maybe they have magical powers, great. Smoking is a pretty clear sign that there's still something going on. The argument has been made that it was just a traditional thing. You know, the smoking is was just what monks did back then in Thailand, which may surprise some of you, but it's actually true. I've in Thailand, in the villages, I've gotten cigarettes in my alms bowl because that was a thing you gave to monks. So the monks just smoked, but you get to a certain point where you realize, you know, this is just not, this isn't food, it isn't medicine. Why am I smoking again? You know? And you realize it's an addiction. I'm not convinced. I, I, I guess I could be convinced that it's possible for an arahant to smoke and to be a smoker, but not convinced that it's all that likely. Again, I think it's a big over overestimation. It's much more likely that these are good monks, but uh, still on the path themselves, or often overestimating their practice through the practice of samatha. That's very common. Someone practice so much samatha meditation that they become very pure in mind temporarily, not realizing that underneath it all they still have lots and lots of defilements, or some defilements in them. I think you're all caught up with questions one day. Oh, and we're over an hour, so enough for tonight. Thanks for your help, Robin. Thank you, Bhante. Good night.